Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everybody. Um, welcome back to another session of the Prophet Sallallahu and I. Uh, today we're going to be covering the uh, topics or the, the parts of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that uh, specifically dealt with the persecution, the migration to Abyssinia, the uh, the the deaths of the Prophet's closest companions, uh, Khadija and uh, Abu Talib, and then also uh, the the year of sorrow that, that this was all encompassed in. We're also going to go into the uh, reconciliation attempts by the Quraysh to see if they can figure anything out. But ultimately, we're going to land uh, at the close of this session going into the migration of the Prophet to Medina. So there's quite a bit that we're going to be diving into. So we want to be sure to be mindful uh, of how how much time we'll spend on it. So we'll try and get through it here. But just as a recap of last time, we covered the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu to Khadija, uh, much more than just the fact that, you know, the thing people stick on to is the, the age difference or the difference uh, in socioeconomic status between these two people getting married. But in fact, there was uh, much more to that marriage that was there. There's so much more to that marriage uh, that has implications for the rest of the sirah. And so uh, we covered the marriage, we covered the first revelation, we covered how the first revelation was a very intimate event. It was a very sacred event, but it was also a very traumatic event for the Prophet ﷺ, something that was not in any sense looked upon as welcome or something that was expected or anything like that. It was something that was uh, completely unexpected. And so we, we, we talked about the, the personal impact of this, but we also talked about what the revelation, what the message meant in a sense of the status quo that it was coming to, as well as what it meant for the people who were to embrace it. So we talked a little bit about that and we talked about the private and the public invitation, how the first three years of the Prophet's message was private, was kept within the home and was within secret kind of gatherings, a private invitation, if you may. And then in the fourth year, uh, Revelation came to give out a public, uh, public call to Islam and how that led to a ramping up of persecution by the Meccan elite and then ultimately a migration to Abyssinia. So we pick up at the persecution by the Meccan elite. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last time as we went into uh, the migration to Abyssinia, but we're going to just cover a couple things before we go into uh, the, the migration and back into there. So the persecution, what, a few things just to lift up there. These people who were being persecuted, the, the, the folks who were being targeted, for the most part, were people that were on their own, in a sense. They, they didn't have men, much agency. They were folks who were either uh, day laborers, they were people who were slaves, they were people who were on the margins. And so people who had some kind of protection, some kind of oath to being uh, affiliated with the tribe or whatnot would be essentially protected. And so people who oftentimes got subjected to this persecution were those who didn't have kind of protection or any tribal allegiance. And so we lift up the examples of the family of Yasser. Uh, we lift up the example of uh, Bilal. Uh, these were uh, of these people. So they have Bilal, you have the family of Yasser, which is Yasser, Ammar, and his wife, uh, um, sorry, Yasser's wife, uh, Sumayya, the mother of Ammar, um, that these people were uh, of the most vulnerable and of the most marginalized, yet they were of the most brutally persecuted. And they are the ones who have uh, you know, more recognition in their name. But just imagine so many others who came into Islam, who came to this movement, who also felt the brunt of their uh, owner's whips, who felt the brunt of uh, the persecution. So we find inspirational stories in this, but we also see just to what extent this uh, this tribal society, this elite would go to try and root out Islam. We talked, uh, we, we were familiar with kind of the story of Bilal, who uh, famously was taken into the desert and, and basically hot stones, hot boulders were put on this person's chest. So he's not just uh, being uh, persecuted physically, but also psychologically, people are uh, yelling at him, taunting him 
for his belief and telling him to change his belief, yet he says he is one. He, is, he says, Ahadun Ahad, just with regards to Allah, that Allah is one. Allah is one. And it's really curious that this cry that was uttered by someone who was deemed a slave, someone who was just deemed on the margin there, this cry of Ahadun Ahad would become uh, one of the battle cries, one of the cries that the Muslims would use during battle, that they would use this. And it would always, it's also curious that this same voice that would be that would be uh, crying this name out, crying this out uh, at with a boulder on their chest in the in the heat of Mecca would also come to the top of Mecca when the time came to recite the uh, the adhan to to give the call to prayer. That this would be the person who calls the prayer, that voice that is strung up. So it shows the. Uh, the, the, the real power that Islam had, the real power that Islam has, especially with regards to bringing folks, regardless of where they might be socioeconomically or where they may be persecuted or whatnot, um, to, to bring them to this egalitarian vision and to give them that agency that may have been taken away from them. And so we see that ha, ha, just in, in a sense that what, what was Bilal thinking? What were these people thinking who were getting persecuted? Sumayya, Yasser, Amar, all these people are being persecuted, yet they did not relent on their faith. Uh, there is a interesting tidbit that talks actually about this with regards to um, how strong emotions can block pain. And so you, you see how much of a conviction they had to this cause. You see how much how important this cause was to not just the Prophet ﷺ, but his followers, his followers who had really nothing to gain. They didn't move up in social mobility. It actually brought them down even further and it got them in even more trouble. Yet they persisted on this. And we look at the psychological aspect of how uh, in, 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 in psychology, uh, studies showing that strong emotions towards something really do block pain. And we see this come back time and time again in the Prophet Sallam's example, uh, as well as in the example of some of the other companions. But we see as well uh, in this, in this uh, aspect that what were they not just going through, but think about the mentality of the people who were wanting to root this out. If you think it's just a simple theological difference, um, then it, 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 we, we wouldn't necessarily go to that much of an extent. You, you want to, you see this as a threat. So not just theologically, there's so much more at stake here. So. <clears throat> We lift up as well the names of Sumayya, Yasir, and Ammar, um, of whom Sumayya was the first, she was the mother of Ammar, she was the wife of Yasir, and she also was the first martyr of Islam. So Islam's first convert was a woman. Islam's first martyr was a woman. And she uh, also, in, 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 in her death, did not relent on her faith, as did her husband, did not relent on their faith. Um, but Ammar, having seen, just imagine, him being persecuted alongside his mother, alongside his uh, father, and seeing both of them killed in a very brutal manner, you know, in a very brutal manner, but still not, not in a sense, uh, kind of being able to process in terms of all that's going on at that moment, giving in, just saying, okay, you know, I, I, I don't believe in Muhammad, I don't believe in the message, I believe in these things. And he, he, he was so overcome by this. He was so overcome by this aspect that he went to the Prophet them and the Prophet said, that's not a problem. Like, you know, those who are persecuted to this extent, it's not compulsory on them to have to hold on to this, their faith in this example. But what's really powerful in this story is apart from all this suffering, you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi uh, was an active witness in this, in this, in seeing what was going on. The Prophet ﷺ was not able to come and to free these people or to do anything. All the Prophet ﷺ was able to do, due to his own powerlessness at the time and his own limited uh, ability, uh, due to the political circumstance, he could only come watch and he could only tell them, "Be patient." be patient, that family of Yasser, paradise is yours. He would come and console them, but he was not able to do much more than that. And his, his example speaks to some of those cases where we might be involved, whether it's a social justice issue or whether it's anything else, and we might not be able to directly help out somebody, but we are able to, there's power in witnessing, there's power in praying. And the Prophet Sallam modeled this when he was standing at the hillside where these people are being persecuted and just telling them to 
be patient, but praying for them, being witness to what is going on, not just thinking that, oh, these people have sacrificed for Islam. Thanks for your service. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have other people take your place. No, he stood and he watched. And just imagine that these, these people are like his children. These people are people he feels responsible for because it's because of his message they are receiving this type of persecution. And so just think about what's going through his mind as well. Uh, one other thing we want to lift up before we transition from the uh, the persecuted is the concept as well as the social welfare element that's intrinsic in Islam. So we talked about last time how uh, other people stepped up to the plate when uh, people who were persecuted were being, uh, you know, put people who were marginalized were being persecuted. So one of these people who came to the to alleviate some of the circumstances was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, of course, if you recall, is one of the first converts to Islam, but also a close friend of the Prophet. He was a merchant who had modest wealth, but who spent that wealth after Islam to free the slaves that he could, to free the people who were being persecuted and buy their freedom. One of these and most famous of these was Bilal. Bilal, who was being persecuted, who was being, uh, you know, basically cooked out in the in the desert heat, um, was someone whose freedom was bought by Abu Bakr. You know, so you see other people coming to care for the situation. They didn't just say, well, this is Muhammad causing all this problem. He should just go figure this out. You see a really tight knit connection that regardless of tribe, regardless of lineage, regardless of status, that Islam gave the early Muslims a psychology of connection to one another. Abu Bakr was from a noble lineage. Abu Bakr was someone who was very respected. Abu Bakr was basically a middle-class person who was doing fairly well. Bilal was a slave from Abyssinia who had no lineage, no person to, to kind of call family or anything. And he was the he was essentially seen as property. Yet Abu Bakr sacrificed what he did for that person. And in a sense, you know, not just leaving the, the Meccan elite a little bit shocked, like what's going on here, but you see the, uh, the recalibration of the psychology that there is unity is not just based on tribalism. Pride is not just based on lineage and all these things that Islam came to disrupt that. And so this was a very powerful yet threatening message, but you can see it acted out in example with the case of Abu Bakr, but also with the case of those on the margins and how everybody worked together, at least in some respect, regardless of where they came from lineage wise. We talked a little bit about how the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned or had thought that it would be really important for him to get firm, powerful, elite support um, that in order to do so, uh, he would get uh, approval from someone who's in the elite, that this would help mitigate the persecution. And so he approached one of the heads of the clans, whose name was Walid ibn Mughira. So he's one of the most influential men of Mecca. His name's Walid. Uh, and he, there's a famous verse and chapter of the Quran that is actually revealed because the Prophet ﷺ is obviously trying to, uh, trying to, you know, butter this guy up and try to get him to, to join Islam because that might be this person is very influential. He might help mitigate some of this persecution that they're facing. But as he's trying to preach the message to him, a blind man comes up to the Prophet ﷺ, whose name is Abdullah ibn, ibn Umm Maktoum. So Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum uh, is someone who also, uh, you know, of a lower socioeconomic status, comes to hear the message and starts to interrupt the Prophet. And the Prophet is is kind of, uh, you know, kind of brushes him aside, but also turns away and frowns and is kind of upset that that he this guy basically ruined my shot to to convert this guy who who could save people's lives, who could help us get out of this rut. Um, and and the revelation comes in, in the Quran in which the Prophet is, 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 is kind of uh, admonished in a sense, in a sense that uh, not to just focus on the one who is, uh, who is just wealthy or has status or has power or whatnot, but to also, this chapter talks about lifting up those who come sincerely, who might not have much in the way of the world or in terms of wealth, but they're one whose attention is worth do over those who aren't even interested, but who we might elevate. So think about this in our time when we try and seek protection or so try and uh, try and seek a kind of advocacy from people who really maybe don't care about us, yet we seek their approval. We, we hold these people in such an esteem and we seek their approval. And if there's other people who come to us who we may not deem as 
equal or as elevated, we sometimes brush them off. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ had this happen to him, and Allah in the in the Quran re rebukes him in a sense and says, "No, that this is this is not the way we do it. This is we, Islam is open for everybody, and especially for those who want to listen. Give them priority over those who you want to have come into the faith." And so it was not just a focus on changing the establishment or converting the elite, but it was also to concentrate and be just as fervent for those who are on the margins who didn't have, they didn't, they didn't have big donations that they could bring to this mosque. They didn't have big wallets that they could come and uh, sustain the Islamic movement, but they have big hearts. And so uh, in this chapter, Allah tells the Prophet to, to look out for that. And so how does this relate to us now that when we, like I said, pander for those who might have wealth, for those who might, uh, you know, not, not have any interest in us, but we forget those who are sincere, but not on the same level. And we think about the people who came to the Prophet ﷺ after this event who started to convert. They were highway robbers. There were people who were vagabonds. There were people who were just on the on the peripheries, yet the Prophet ﷺ welcomed them with open arms more so than he would uh, if they were just elites. He didn't just say, ah, okay, I got this like random guy who's in the middle of nowhere. No, he, he, he took it as a big victory for somebody to come. And so as we transition now, the persecution gets to a boiling point to where the Prophet says, look, we need to get people out of here. We need to get some kind of respite. Otherwise, as we will see, the persecution begins to turn on the people, even those who are secure, even those who have tribal protection. Um, so the, the, the persecution starts to boil up and eventually it's going to touch those people who right now are seemingly untouchable in a sense because they have tribal connections. So he gets the people going to, my, to Abyssinia, to present day Ethiopia. And we talked a little bit about the uh, this logistics of this uh, of this migration. So we won't dive into that. But the one thing I want to dive into for today gives an insight into the society that these Muslims were seeking amnesty from. So the testimony of Jafar, the cousin of the Prophet Sallam, before the, uh, the Negus, before the uh, king of Abyssinia, was one that we hold up here. We can derive so many gems of it because it highlights the importance not, not just of amnesty, regardless of faith to those in need, but it also shows just what, the, what Islam was bringing in antithesis to what was already there. So in, as Jafar relates, we were an ignorant people. We worshiped idols, we ate meat of dead carcasses, we were accustomed to lewd behavior, to severing ties of kinship, to neglecting our neighbors, to uh, consuming the weak, to uh, just taking over those who did not have any stature. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us to single out Allah, to worship Allah alone, and he also commanded us to be truthful in our speech, to fulfill our trusts, to nurture ties of kinship, to be kind to the neighbor, to refrain from spilling blood unlawfully. They forbade us from lewd behavior, bad speech, consuming the orphan's wealth, slandering chaste women, performing prayer, and to perform the fast. And for this, our people rose up against us, punishing us, torturing us, to get us to leave our religion, to return to worshiping idols and to the ways of the past. When they overpowered and restricted us, we came to you, speaking to the Najashi, to the, to the, to the Nijis of Abyssinia. And that these Muslims were able to then stay in Abyssinia. They pleaded their case. They were able to stay in Abyssinia. But what we take from this is that there weren't too many new things being introduced in, in the sense of Islam coming here. We talked about how pre-Islamic ethics, pre-Islamic virtues were mostly all of these in the sense of upholding ties to kinship, of giving uh, trust to one another, of taking care of those who are weak, of not marginalizing those, of speaking truth. All these different things were pre-Islamic that were there. And they had become distorted to such a point that Islam not only came to elevate them, but to also change that value, to change that virtue to a completely different degree. But you see that a lot of these things that, apart from the theological frame, these things weren't new. These things were a renewal of sorts. And so we see that when the Prophet ﷺ sent these people to Abyssinia, when these people sought, uh, migrate, sought asylum in Abyssinia, they weren't they weren't, they weren't coming to a finished Islamic religion. They weren't coming from a finished Islamic religion. They were coming from a, a faith that was just, you know, five years or so old. This was year five of the message. It wasn't anything too conclusive. They didn't have a full Quran. They didn't have five daily prayers. They didn't have any of this stuff. They had a very basic religion, yet the Prophet ﷺ was comfortable with sending them 
to a foreign land where there weren't any other Muslims, yet trusted them to practice their faith and to be able to sustain themselves there. Some people had passed away in Abyssinia. Many had come back uh, after later, later on in the biography, as we'll cover. But it just makes you think, what did the Prophet teach these people? What did the Prophet tell these people to where they were able to get through and keep their faith despite not having all of those things that we do that we sometimes maybe complicate our religious practice with. So we think about what, what, what was their faith? What did they have? They didn't really have too much of a Quran. They probably had a few surahs, a few chapters here and there. Uh, they had a couple prayers, but what else do they have? They don't have all these other fancy things. What, what, what else was there apart from each other? So we, vow, we think about how did community play a part in Abyssinia when they were away from home? So we then transition once uh, the Abyssinian affair occurs in which the Meccans are unable to bring back the, uh, the immigrants from Mecca, the Muslim immigrants, uh, and bring them back, uh, we see that the tide starts to change a little bit for the Muslims at least. So you have some key conversions that take place, notably of the Prophet's uncle, Hamza, and of uh, one of the most severe enemies to the Islamic cause, uh, Armur. So Hamza though was a relative of the Prophet He was a relative in more ways than one. He was his uh, father's half brother, and he was also uh, related to him in a couple different ways with regards to uh, his mother's side, as well as um, his, his, his sister, his own sister marrying the Prophet's brother-in-law. There was a lot of different connection that this person had to the Prophet Sallallahu And he, was, he never opposed him, but he hadn't publicly supported him either. And Martin Lings calls Hamza the most formidable and unyielding of the, of the Quraysh. And so he was known as a hunter. He was quite, you know, burly, like a, a big guy that you don't want to mess with. Um, and he converted inadvertently uh, in, or in a fit of rage because he had come back to the sanctuary uh, to, to after his hunt. And he had been told that the Prophet ﷺ had just been severely rebuked and disrespected by uh, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, who was one of the top uh, persecutors of the uh, of, of the Muslims, uh, who the Prophet ﷺ had said, this man is the Pharaoh of my community, of my ummah, uh, he is Pharaoh. So we think about Moses and Pharaoh and the relationship that's there. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ singled out Abu Jahl and said, this guy, this guy's mean, he, he means trouble, he's not a good guy. So he, you see Abu Jahl doing this and out of Jahiliya, out of this tribal connection, Hamza gets so worked up and goes and basically in a sense, uh, you know, smacks Abu Jahl and says, hey, you don't touch him because I'm Muslim too. And so his, his, his shahada came at a point of anger and out of tribalism, but he became a very strong supporter of the prophet and one that uh, was had set a precedent in a sense that, oh, the Muslims now have Hamza, all right? We can't probably mess with them as we used to because he's somebody we should fear. And Abu Jahl's persecution, it's very interesting to note, we, we think about this and we've come back to this and we will keep coming back to this because this saga continues, but this persecution is posited maybe not just theological, because like I said, it's not just a theological thing, but what is the source of it? Why so much of this antagonism? And we see uh, there's a, 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 uh, a reason given here by Montgomery Watt, who says that it possibly may have been because there's also a power vacuum that that you see this this generational gap it's starting to fold over so new people are starting to take over old people are going to pass away and so the mantle is about to be up there who's going to grab it and so you see somebody like Abu Jahl who's very much uh, about power who's very much about consolidating that power this was especially threatening for him as someone who was basically next in line to take over if you have somebody like Muhammad come and essentially being recognized as yeah we'll take allegiance we will uh, give you our pledge and make you the, uh, the king amongst kings or the, our, our ruler, you see how for someone like Abu Jahl, who is part of that elite and someone in line to take over, how Islam was not just a theological threat, Islam was also a power grab by some people who he, did, he saw didn't deserve it. So what did he do? Lash out in a sense how people do, who, who struggle with sharing power. They, they attack those who are most vulnerable. So he attacked his uh, and persecuted and killed his own uh, servants who were the family of Yasser. And he caused so many other persecutions to other Muslims that were there. Now, the irony of it is, is that his, his nephew, Armar, 
who was 26 years old at the time, was also an outspoken critic of the prophet. Didn't fall too far from his uncle's tree in terms of uh, giving Islam a, uh, a bit of a rough time. But he saw how the new faith was dividing families and society. And so he made it a point that, look, this is, we've had enough. It's been five, six years of this. Let's just, get, let's just get it done. He saw people migrating to Abyssinia. He sees what Islam is causing from his point of view to this uh, society and to my family and to all these different things. So he goes and makes his way to the Prophet Sums out, says, hey, man, I'm just going to end it right now. And Omar is not someone who's a small person. He's, he's, he's also seen someone like a Hamza, someone who's big, someone who's not to be messed with, and someone whose temper will really get the best of them. And so he goes to the Prophet's house. But in the meanwhile, as he's on his way there, he gets rerouted by someone who is aware of this and says, hey, no, you know, that, uh, don't go to the Prophet's house. Uh, your own family is, is Muslim. And so he becomes even more incensed at this. And he goes to his sister's house. And there's a famous tradition of how he goes into his sister's house and he basically causes a ruckus. He, you know, attacks his brother-in-law. He inadvertently or so strikes his sister. Um, and when he sees what he's done, he calms down. He's like, okay, or he doesn't get calm down. He over, he's overwhelmed. He's just like, okay, there's obviously a lot going on here. Let me just hear what you have to say. And so by hearing the Quran, he's a bit overcome. He's a bit overcome and he, he's, he just doesn't know what he's just heard, but he's very convinced at that point that whatever I was, whatever I just did, this, this verse, this chapter has spoken to me. So we also see in this revelation that the Quran uh, is, had a very personal connection to people, had a very personal connection to those who came into the faith. And so he comes into the, uh, the gathering um, and he basically leaves as a Muslim, but he goes straight to the prophet's uh, home and he goes straight to the prophet's home to convert. But it's really interesting because as I mentioned, Omar's of a personality that people were afraid of, but also it was said that uh, people would say that this person, uh, Omar could become a Muslim and other people were like, no, his donkey would become Muslim before he would become Muslim. You know, they would say that there's no way this guy's going to become Muslim. Look at him. He's, he's, he's absolutely not going to be uh, in that in that line. Um, and so he went to the prophet's uh, home with a sword in his hand. So it tells you just how just uh, he, he's probably not as situationally aware, but he goes home. But at, what, what's what's interesting is that he, he takes the Shahada. He takes that um, the, the, the pledge and becomes a Muslim. And so what follows immediately is very funny. If you see the series Omar, um, which is a Qatari TV series, it's a, I believe a 30 episode series. They actually, you know, re, re, uh, um, reimagine this scenario kind of playing out. But after he takes the pledge, becomes a Muslim, the first thing he does is not to sit there and, you know, learn the faith. He goes to his uncle's house, Abu Jahl, and he goes to his uncle's house and says, hey man, um, I'm now a Muslim. So he knocks at the door and his, his uncle opens the door. He says, I'm a Muslim. And the guy shuts the door in his face. And he's like, okay, whatever with you. So you see that this was a person who gave Islam a sense of courage, gave the Muslims a sense of courage and public legitimacy and security, but also his example teaches us because someone making a comment, we see that comment happen so many times in our day, especially for people who may not look South Asian or Middle Eastern, that this person must be a convert. This person must not be um, true Muslim or whatnot, uh, or this person may not be able to come to Islam if it's somebody who uh, is just seen as on the periphery. But the story of Umar, when we see how one of Islam's most valiant, most powerful voices and advocates became a Muslim, it teaches us to not pronounce final judgment or anything on anybody. And that remembering Allah's infinite power should mean healthy self-doubt as to ourself. That's okay to struggle, but also suspending our judgment towards other people. Don't, don't make an assu assumption of someone just because of what they may uh, have done or whatnot and what that may be capable of in the future. So Arma's example gives us that hope that people can change, that we can change. And it's it, and and that Islam is not restricted just to those who are outwardly pious or those who are just uh, in it since the beginning. It's for everybody, even those who are maybe on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. And so you see, once Hamza comes into the picture, once Omar comes into the picture, Islam becomes a much more has has that. Uh, more public flavor to it. So the Muslims are much more comfortable going outside, going and finally feeling safe, uh, praying at the Kaaba, because now you go with these two big burly guys who people don't want to mess with, and they're essentially like your bodyguards. And so now, as opposed to having those house churches that we talked about, those house mosques, where they just meet uh, in, in, in seclusion, we talk a little bit about what they, what they do here.
So I want to just lift up real quick as a side tangent. What were these gatherings like? Because before Omar, before the uh, before Hamza, uh, the pair of them converted the Prophet as I mentioned, they were gathering in secret activities. They were gathering in secret gatherings and making sure they didn't just disrupt anything. They were making sure they didn't cause any uh, bit of a uh, a bit of a, a ruckus because they saw what the impact of that was. So out of safety, they wanted to pray just within their homes. I'm going to just read a quick bit uh, from the Shamayl of the Prophet, which is his characteristics, um, from his cousin Ali, uh, who talks about what the Prophet was like in gatherings, in small gatherings, in educational gatherings. And you can kind of get a sense of what it was like to sit with the Prophet What was it like beyond the fact that they were sitting alone and because they were persecuted? No, there was a whole humanistic element to it. We'll lift that up real quick. So uh, Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib related that I then asked him, my father, uh, about his interaction with the, with the people outside his house, him being the Prophet Sallallahu And he responded, the Prophet Sallallahu peace be upon him, controlled his tongue, only speaking regarding that which concerned him. He brought unity amongst every group and made them the leaders of their groups. He warned the people and was cautious when dealing with people to preserve his status among them, but he never lacked courtesy towards others. Those who were close to him were the best of people, those uh, the best of whom in his eyes were the ones who wished everybody well, and the ones with the highest status in his eyes were the ones with the most compassion, who aided the creation the most. I then asked my father about his gatherings, and he said that he began and he ended all his gatherings with the remembrance of Allah. When he came to a gathering, he sat where there was space available, and he instructed the people to do the same. He gave every attendee their due respect and rights to a degree that led every individual person to think that that person was honoring, uh, was being honored the most. When an individual came to sit with him or came regarding some issue, he would remain seated until that person began to get up. So whenever he was asked for something, he would fulfill that request and did not re refuse it. And if he did not possess something which he was required, he would advise a person with soft and kind words. And his affection and good manners were for all and not restricted to certain people. He was like a father to them and he was just just and fair with each of them. So you get an image of the Prophet Sallam that not only is this person just having these talim or education classes that everybody come, okay, we're gonna learn Islam, let's just learn it like a class. This was a very intimate gathering. This was a very personal gathering that was meant and this was one where everybody felt honored regardless of their gender, regardless of their difference. They came to that space, they could be merchants, they could be slaves, they could be people who are top of the line, they could be people who are Arab, they could be non-Arab. Uh, and he made them feel valued to such an extent and gave them that respect. So just thinking about these, when we think about, when we say gatherings and we say this stuff, it's sometimes just like, okay, small, 10 people are getting together, but you think about the intimacy of this type of event and the impact it has on spirituality. And then you connect it back to the people who are willing to die for this faith. You think that's not just an ideology they're subscribing to, there's something really personal about it. They were being valued in a way that the society around them was never valuing them, didn't give them that attention. And so the Prophet was not only giving them a listening ear, but making them feel seen and heard in, in a space like that. <clears throat> so as we go through um, and, and, and just kind of wrap on the second half of this, we see that the Meccans had seen that, you know, you have two powerful people who just converted. Let's try and reconcile with them. Let's try and make some diplomatic efforts to just resolve this question of Islam. And so they made offers of power. They made offers of wealth. They made offers of rulership for uh, possessions, all these different things. And the Prophet ﷺ would just refuse it. The Prophet ﷺ would be like, no, that's not what I'm after. And it gives a testament to what the message of Islam really meant, and what the message of the Prophet ﷺ meant. It wasn't a power grab. If he wanted power, it was right there. It was ready for him to be given. But he just, uh, he, he said, no, that's, that's not for what we're here for. We're here for something else. And he would consistently rebuke these offerings with the recitation of the Quran. He would he would tell them, remind them what uh, what what they're offering is not what uh, Islam is seeking. Islam is seeking things beyond the embellishments of this world. It is seeking the hereafter. And so, a, you know, we see that what the Islam what the message of Islam meant when we compare it to how it was different from the Hanifism the monotheism that existed before Islam got there, that people were familiar with that. Yeah, well, having one God is not a foreign concept to us. It's something that we, we, we are aware of. We know people like that. But Reza Aslan talks about how the Prophet was not just preaching the religion of Abraham, which people who are considered Hanifs were doing. 
but he was in fact a new Abraham of sorts. He had this image of prophethood of God's representative. And so people on the outside did see this as a power grab, like, hey, why can't he just preach it? Why does he have to be the one who uh, we pledge allegiance to, or he the one that we have to listen to or whatnot? So uh, no, no authority was being given uh, as much so as to the Prophet in this case, not, not necessarily as first among equals, but it was Muhammad Sallallahu as the Prophet of God, that no other Prophet beside him. And so you could see this from the lens of the tribal, uh, the tribal lens in the sense that this was, a, this was seen as a power grab. And so the reaction, not that it's justified in a sense, but you see a reaction coming uh, and attacking this concept of that, oh my God, that this isn't a religion, this is just him trying to make a power grab. How do we stop that? And so we see how the Prophet Sallallahu uh, his interaction with the tribes, with the people who were persecuting him, it wasn't after control. It wasn't after power. If he wanted that, he clearly could have had that. But uh, even after this, even after these things, you see the Quraysh continue to, beyond going from the diplomacy, now start to harass him even more, now start to ask him for signs, for miracles, for all these different things. And you see at least six more years of persecution and harassment that it may have been a religious message that they were triggered by, but it had social, economic, political, intellectual influence. And so it made it much more difficult to deal with than just someone saying, okay, you wanna debate religion? Let's debate religion because they didn't do that in a sense. They didn't offer up somebody to debate religion. They saw this message reaching in so many different corners. They didn't even know where to start with this. So let's just buy this guy out and just say, hey, you know, just, just keep to yourself. We're, we're good. And so just for context, the process is about 46 at this time. So this is six years after the, uh, the revelation. So six years in the, the dawah, the message of Islam has gone public after four years. And so now you are at a point where Islam is in the forefront, but it is now starting to get intensified persecution. A portion of people have left to Abyssinia. It's even more vulnerable, but you have a couple people who are uh, giving it some kind of protection just because of their bravado. So through Omar and Hamza. Now, what do the Quraysh do? Because you can't touch them because if you do, you're gonna incur the wrath of two very powerful people. What are you gonna do? You go into a, you, you drop sanctions on them. So you can't convince them diplomatically. You can't invite them to your faith or any kind of reconciliation. They then drop a sanction on them. And so the leaders of the Quraysh, with the exception of a few people, <clears throat> come and draft a uh, crippling sanction against the Prophet's clan that nobody can trade with these people, with nobody can marry with these people until they renounce Muhammad, until they renounced his message, and until they renounce the people who had accepted, or if they had just walked back on what they said. His own uncle, who was a part of this clan that was being targeted, said, I have no ties, Abu Lahab for whom there is a chapter named in the Quran, he said, I have no ties to this tribe. You guys do what you want. These are his own friend, his family. And he, he throws them under the bus in a sense, but he cuts his tribal ties. And Muhammad's clan, the Banu Hashim and the Banu Muttalib, his, uh, his, his own kinfolk, they are essentially exiled. They are pushed into a valley. They are deprived of food. They're deprived of basic trade. They're deprived of marriage. They're deprived of, they're socially boycotted. They're also uh, just logistically boycotted in a sense. And so this became, this, this was not just an expression of theological differences. This was not just something philosophical. This was also to preserve Mecca's uh, emerging plutocracy, a control of wealthy people, a control of the most powerful. Because as I mentioned, it comes back to power when you see what Islam would have meant. It meant an egalitarian society. It meant a leadership of one person or a, at least a uh, de facto type of leadership to one person, but free from tribal attachments. And so you see that uh, this was also a power move that was being made by the Quraysh against the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu or against the clan of the Prophet Sallallahu And it had, this ban lasted for three years and it had immense consequences. It pushed the tribes of the clans of the Prophet Sallallahu to a point of starvation. It pushed them to a point to where people who are outside of the clan would have to smuggle food, smuggle food and supplies to these camps. So Abu Bakr, Umar, all these people would supply food um, and try to get, get, uh, get this ban relieved. But it, it just the harshness of that climate led so many people uh, in a sense to that brink of starvation, even some who may have passed whose names we don't have. But what really stands out is after these three years of hunger and hardship, the ban was finally lifted because people who were not Muslim within the Meccan elite said this is wrong based on uh, they, they, they had some 
some type of semblance of the pre-Islamic virtues. And they said, no, this is, this is wrong. People are out there. There are kinfolk. We are all related in some way, shape or form. And you're killing them out there. They, they stood up for uh, the Muslims when the Muslims were not people who they necessarily uh, aligned with ideologically with or on faith wise. And so it gives you the uh, perspective that non-Muslim allies time and time again have come to the service of Islam at the very beginning, that non-Muslim allies have been there. And in this case, uh, they helped overturn that ban, helped lift the ban and to where the Muslims were welcome back in uh, to, to Mecca. But you see how these things worked out that it wasn't just a very simplistic narrative. There were people there who didn't really have a stake in the game, but because of their pre-Islamic values had decided that we wanna stand up against this because this isn't right. So when we write off pre-Islamic values as just one brush stroke, that it's just completely bad, we do a disservice to some of those people that the Prophet ﷺ himself praised later on in life who stood up for Muslims when nobody else would. So the aftermath of the ban was followed by a very difficult year. It's called the year of sadness, the year of sorrow. It took place about the 10th year after the message. So 619 uh, CE, if you, if you want to kind of conceptualize it. So it was lifted, but what was so uh, depressing and so marked about this year was the fact that the Prophet's two main supporters died. First and foremost, his uncle, Abu Talib, who was like a father to him. It was someone who uh, had not only provided him protection, but was literally like a father, had raised him since he was about uh, eight, six, uh, six years old, or sorry, eight years old, he was, he was raised. And so he spent over 40 years or so with the Prophet I'm over 40 years with this person. And he had lived with this person, I believe it was actually 42 years or so, um, that he had lived with this person and uh, or had at least a connection to this person. And this person passed away. What, even, what made it even more difficult was that uh, Abu Talib passed away uh, without giving a clear indication if he became Muslim or not. And so the Prophet ﷺ was very aggrieved by this because it was, it's like he was, he was, he had, this was someone who was like his father, it was someone who was so close to him. And the one person who would, who had defended him despite everything, yet did not buy his message, did not embrace it. It was a very difficult loss for the Prophet Sum. So we talked last time about the different traumas that the Prophet Sum was facing. So we think about traumas in a sense of like these little T traumas and big T traumas. And you think about how many big T traumas the Prophet Sum is taking that basically he, he, he wasn't alive when his father had passed away. He was in, in the womb, but now he's spent almost 40 plus years with someone who's basically like his father. And this person who believed in him, but did not believe his message passed away and so you see the implications the psychological effects that it has on somebody like that and it didn't get any better because the Prophet Sallam's greatest supporter of all is his, his most beloved person to ever come into existence was Khadija his wife who had passed away just around the same time some people say Khadija passed away before Abu Talib some people say Abu Talib passed away before Khadija but they were separated by about three months whoever came first came first and went first but uh, Khadija died she was 65 years old. So you can tell both of these people are fairly old. They must have had some kind of impact from the uh, ban that took place. But she was survived by four daughters. She uh, was someone who the Prophet some would speak of to where we get an idea of how much she meant to the Prophet some. We shared this last time, but it's so powerful to hear when the Prophet some said, in speaking in her memory, that she believed in me when everybody disbelieved in me. She trusted me when nobody else trusted me. She helped me and comforted me in her own person and in her wealth when nobody else would. She provided me children when nobody else would. And so you see, this person's contribution was not just that, oh, they were my wife. They, they, they did, they, now if she's gone, she's gonna, uh, who, uh, who am I, who's gonna clean the, uh, the, uh, the dishes? Who's gonna do all this stuff? No, the process of saw past all of these things and saw the person for who she was and what a landmark she was uh, in, in, in the, the cornerstone in the Islamic movement. And so she was truly someone who you could say was like a sign of Allah from uh, for the Prophet Sallallahu so like an ayah, uh, a sign. And her absence, as I mentioned, we'll talk about it throughout the seerah, but it's felt. He never forgets when he sees things that belong to Khadija, when he sees people who were related to Khadija come and meet him, the memories just all rush back. So you look at the Prophet Sallallahu and again, another 
big trauma loss that, that he, he faces, but you see in his memory how he deals with it. He's often overcome when he sees these people or he sees these mementos. Uh, and you think about how the Prophet never forgot. He always remembered these things. And we talked about that when his mother had passed away and almost 50 years later, he had walked by where she had passed away and he came to her grave and started weeping. And he remembered that this is where she passed away. So you, you see the memory of the Prophet in this aspect. And so as uh, after um, Khadija dies, after Abu Talib dies, his biggest supporter was Abu Bakr. And he was uh, publicly beaten. He was, he, he was practicing Islam and teaching it openly. And he started to be attacked and marginalized and kicked out by his tribe. And so he was also you know, disowned, per se. And he had spent most of his money in the way of Islam. What was very interesting was that he was exiled. So he was like, OK, I'll just go to Abyssinia. He's going on his way to Abyssinia. And he encounters somebody who's actually one of his old trade partners or his friends and says, hey, man, uh, where are you going? You're, you're Abu Bakr. And he's like, my people have like kicked me out. They haven't treated me well. So I'm going to go somewhere else and find some refuge. He said, no, you're under my protection. So you can go back and live in your home. And the Quraysh had accepted this person's protection, but they said, hey, man, don't, he, he only prays inside his home. He doesn't come out here. And so what did Abu Bakr do? He participated in his own kind of protest. He built a mini mosque right in the extension of his home uh, so people could see him, but it was within his home. So he's he's kind of agitating him a little bit, but he's still uh, doing what, uh, what, what, what was meant for him, what was essentially... Uh, uh, true for him. So he builds his own mosque, a little niche in his courtyard, uh, so people can see him pray, but they're, they're, they can't do anything because it's in his, in his home. So you see this kind of civil disobedience that is rooted within the tradition uh, and in the examples of it. So now as all this is kind of going on, you see this year of sorrow passes. It's very difficult because it's hard to even summarize what the Prophet was going, uh, was, was going through because so many traditions will relate how he was essentially depressed. He was, uh, he was completely grieved and, and naturally so. A father figure had just passed away. A, his closest wife, uh, his closest friend had passed away. And we talked a little bit about how she, because of her older age, may have also brought some of those motherly qualities um, to and that motherly love that he never had. So you think about the, the qualities that were taken away and the response that he had. He was saddened. He was grieved. He was crying. He was depressed. He wouldn't come out of his house for days. And it's natural. So you see, you see this in the Prophet's life. But now you see after the death of Abu Talib, after this protection falls apart, because like I said, if you don't have protection in Mecca in this time from a tribe or from somebody, then you are fair game to be eliminated if you are deemed to pose a threat. And so he, having been in this situation, basically being seen as fair game, as being uh, ready to be eliminated by the Quraysh, uh, they intensify their opposition and persecution. They start to throw animal entrails on him. They start to throw dirt in his face. They do all this thing. They physically assault him. They choke him while he's in prayer. Uh, and his daughter, Fatima, when she sees this, when she is wiping the mud off his face after he's been just humiliated, she starts to cry. And the Prophet consoles her. He, he, he tells her, you know, uh, Allah will take care of your father. So this, this girl also just thinking about Fatima, her mom just passed away. And now she's seeing her father on the edge of about to lose his life too. Just think about the trauma that's going through her mind, what, what, what she might be thinking. And as she's taking care of four, uh, three other siblings um, that are there. So in light of this pressing situation, that this unbearable situation that's in Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu seeks asylum in the mountain oasis town of Taif, which is about 60 miles away from Mecca. It's in the mountains and it's, it's, it's a place that is uh, quite the opposite of Mecca. So it receives a lot of rain, it's fairly fertile. So they, he and his adopted son go there, try to proselytize to them, but they are eventually chased out after a few days and they're stoned out. They, they, they're not just chased out and said, hey, get out of here. They are stoned out. They are driven out as if they are um, some rabble rousers, as if they are some unwanted people. And what's really powerful about this is that the Prophet Sallallahu at this point, he's, he's left his main home. He's sought refuge somewhere, didn't get that. His main supporters have died. He sits under a tree after you know, finding some shade, after running away from this mob, and his feet are bloodied. And he lets out this prayer that truly tells you he was at the end of his length. He was at the end of his limb and he was just, he, he had surrendered to God at this moment. And he says this prayer that, oh Allah, to you I complain of my weakness. To you I complain of my lack of resources and my humiliation before the people. You are the most merciful of those who show mercy. You are the Lord of the weak and you are my Lord. To whom are you entrusting me? To somebody in the distant that attacks me or to an enemy that you gave uh, control over my affairs? 
if you are not angry with me, then I don't care. But your protection is much better and much more ample for me. I seek protection in the light of your face, which illuminates the darkness and through which all affairs in this life and in the hereafter become right. May it never be that I should encounter your wrath or that you should be displeased with me. I will appeal to you until you're pleased with me. There's no power and there's no way except through you. So you see, he was frustrated. You see, he was just at his limb. He did not have any more fight left in him. And he's just, he, he's just like, what, where am I going to go? But you see how the Prophet had, had, had interacted here. Uh, and just before we move on to the final portion with regards to his departure from Mecca, at this time when, he's, when he does, when makes his prayer, uh, he's sitting at the orchard of, uh, of some people. And you know the, these people were from Mecca, actually. So uh, they send a servant boy to you know, go check on this guy. It was this guy who just came and sat down. And he comes up. Uh, and he has some dates for the Prophet. He's, he's a servant child and he comes, and he brings some dates. Uh, and he says, you know, hey, just you, you look like you're in rough position. You're not you're not you're not looking too hot. Um, here's some dates like, you know, just just uh, cool off a little bit. And the Prophet says, Bismillah. He says, Bismillah. And he takes a bite. And this uh, the slave child, this boy, his name's Adas. And Adas says like, whoa, like, where are you from? Like people here don't say like Bismillah or like, where are you from? And so it's so, so many beautiful things because the Prophet says that, uh, you know, he said, where are you from? And Adas says, I'm from Nineveh. Nineveh is in Iraq, where Jonah, Jonah and uh, the prophet who, you know, was, uh, went into the whale, that, that where, where Jonah's from. And, he, and so the Prophet says, oh, I'm the brother of Jonah, son of Mata um, from Nineveh. And, you know, he was a prophet, I'm a prophet, and we're brothers. And uh, this, this kid was just like so astonished at that time. Uh, we, we see so many, uh, you know, and that, that, that he was just overcome with what, who, who he's just interacted to. But we lift up a few different things here. One, we lift up the practice of Islam in even the most difficult situations. The Prophet ﷺ was just at the end of his limb. He had just been bullied out of a town. He had just been kicked out of a town. He'd been kicked out of his own town. He's really there. No one would fault him if he was just like, you know what, I'm just going to eat this date. You know, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm not going to say Bismillah. I'm just going to eat this date. But he's mindful. He's mindful. And he says, in the name of Allah. And he starts. And that interaction starts a conversation that is an interfaith conversation because we see that Adas was a Christian. Adas came to the Prophet and to serve him when the Prophet's own people were not there. And it relates a parable to the Christian king who gave asylum to the Muslims in Abyssinia when other people would not give them asylum. And so it speaks to the significance of how much these non-Muslims really did play a formative role in helping Islam. And just a small interaction here shows us that if we are to practice our faith outside, it doesn't have to be out loud and about and all these different things. It could just be something as just following our morals, just following our faith and just saying Bismillah. Just starting something like that, the Prophet changed someone's heart just by saying Bismillah. And so you, you see that, that parallel that's there. So now as we return back to Mecca, the Prophet obviously he's at Taif, he's uh, got kicked out of Taif, he just got done resting from a tree. He's like, you know what, we're, we're on our way out. Like I, I need to go back to Mecca. We need to regroup, see what we can do because his supporters are still there. So he goes to Mecca, he receives the protection. Again, a non-Muslim steps in uh, by the name of Mutim. So Mutim steps in and says, I will give you protection. And he basically sends his sons with the prophet to the Kaaba and he says, hey, go walk him in, tell people in Mecca that Muhammad's under our protection. And they do. So he's, he's an ally and he, he, he responds because he was one of those people that said, lift the ban, lift the ban, stop this, this is not who we are. So you see that the Prophet had some supporters who did not buy his message, but by their own virtue and their tribal ethic, they felt obligated to stand up for someone who was oppressed. And so he offered protection in that case. And so we see the Prophet once he comes back to uh, Mecca, he then has this, uh, this experience. Some people, most people interpret it as a uh, physical, literal uh, miracle. Some people interpret it as a spiritual or a metaphorical miracle, but the Isra and the Miraj. So he's at, again, he's, he's brought in, he has minimal kind of protection that he's under, but he just imagine what he's just gone through. We've zipped through it in a few minutes here, but just imagine all the, the pain, the blood, sweat and tears that he shed and where he's at right now. And he is now given or given the vision, given the experience of a journey in which he has shown uh, Jerusalem, he has shown his fellow prophets, he is able to interact, and he's also shown the heavens. And the significance of this event shows not just 
how, uh, you know, God had said, hey, let me just give you a tour of what, what all is to come. But it shows for each of us as Muslims, that paradigm of Muslim spirituality, outlining that the path that each of us must take away from our preconceptions, away from our prejudices, our own finite limitations and our egos, and to really transcend, to really connect with our faith at the lowest points, that we have that potential, that when the Prophet was at his lowest point in this world, he received a connection that was to the highest that he would ever receive. And so uh, he goes through this Isra and Mehraj. I'll post some additional information so you can read on it. There's so much that is there. But uh, after this experience, the five daily prayers came into being. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the five daily prayers weren't just prescribed like, hey, okay, I want y'all to pray five times now. There was a whole back and forth and a, a back and forth that led to these prayers coming. And so you see that the prayers were not just ordained because, hey, we want you to get some exercise. Your Muslims are out of shape. Uh, but we want uh, to have a way for you to connect to God. We want you to have a way to connect to Allah. Uh, and so the, the significance of prayer beyond just the fact that, hey, we do prayer, seeing how it came about is quite a bit. And this was a turning point. This journey was a turning point because it reminded the Prophet of that regardless of how low he would be put in this world, his wealth, his protection, his wife, none of that would be availing to him, but that he was re reminded that his only dependent, uh, his only one to be dependent on is God and that God could elevate him from there. So he goes to the people and he tells them like, hey, I just went to Jerusalem and I just went to heaven. I saw this and people ridicule him. He, he, he goes against the counsel of, uh, of his cousin, Umehane, who says, hey, don't tell people this. They're going to they're going to be they're going to say you're, you're you've gone mad. Uh, and he's like, no, I want to share the truth with them. And he goes and he tells them, hey, I just went and saw Jerusalem and whatnot. So he gets roasted. He gets attacked, ridiculed. But what stands out is that uh, Abu Bakr has said in this time that people are like, yo, Abu Bakr, your companion has lost it. Now he's saying he's going to Jerusalem. And Abu Bakr says, Oh, if he said it, it's true, because he's told me things that are even more remarkable than this. Every time I see him, he'll bring down, he'll have revelation that he says comes from the heavens. So that's much even more remarkable to me. And so Abu Bakr earns the title of a Sadiq, or the, 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 the one who recognizes truth, the one who speaks truth as well. So he earns this title, but he, he, his faith is unwavering. You see what he's gone through, and he's just like, if he said it, it's true. Like, what, what, do, I, what do I care? And so uh, now as we kind of close out here, uh, next time, inshallah, we'll talk about the hijrah. But what I want to talk about in these final few minutes here is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously at, is at the end of his limb here in Mecca. Uh, so where does relief come from? Relief comes from a most unexpected place, uh, which is from the form of Yathrib. Yathrib is a uh, city just to the north of Mecca. It's an oasis. It's a fertile land uh, surrounded by volcanic rocks. It's a very interesting topography. If you go on Google Maps and you just look up Medina uh, and you see what it's surrounded by. So it's an oasis that's surrounded by these interesting you know, geographical formations, but it's a mainly a farming community. It's a series of kind of hamlets and fortresses. Uh, they're, they're not like the Quraysh. They don't have a dependence on commerce and they have still, because they're a little bit more rural. You think of uh, a, a, a town like Austin and then you think somebody a little bit more out, maybe like uh, Waco or like Taylor or, or Belton or J you know any, any kind of small city that doesn't have the same type of vibe there um, or dependency on trade. They're more an agricultural community, but because they were still in that set, they had more of a recognition of the old uh, virtues and values that were becoming diluted within the Meccan society. So we see that Yathrib or Medina was not just uh, was not just appealing because, hey, Mecca is not giving us any refuge. Let's go to Medina. But practically speaking, the people had a different vibe there. The, the value system was different that made it more fertile, not just in literal sense that you can plant plants there and have them grow, but you can have uh, a, a, a community grow in an environment where people care about each other. And so it consisted of two dominant tribes, the Aus and the Khazraj, uh, who were actually at a bitter crossroads. They were having a series of wars, series of disputes. So there's a lot of back and forth with these two. And they also lived with a substantive uh, Jewish population. So almost 20 tribes, uh, Jewish Arab tribes, were living in Medina at the time or Yathrib at the time. And so the Aus and Khazraj, they are at a crossroads. They can't get things resolved. They come to Mecca uh, as part of their annual pilgrimage to try and find some reconciliation because they're like, look, we've had so many wars, we've had all this stuff, let's just get some reconciliation. Uh, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi approaches them and he uh, preaches to them and they're like, okay, hey, this guy, this guy sounds like he can, he can take care of our problem. Um, he, he's, what he's saying is pretty reasonable. Um, and so he 
takes a pledge from them and they come back and they take subsequent pledges uh, to basically solidify the fact that we're going to become Muslim, we're going to uh, take you in, but also uh, you, you can come to Medina, you, can, we, we, you have safe harbor with us. But the pledges, it's interesting to note, they are primarily concerned with the ethics of being, the ethics of interacting. The Prophet tells them that uh, don't associate anything with God. Okay, theologically we get that, but don't steal, don't fornicate. Don't practice infanticide. Don't bury your little girls. Don't kill your kids. Don't slander. Don't disobey um, the prophet in that which is right. And then he comes back as well. And he says, uh, when they come back, they said, hey, spend on those who are uh, in, in scarcity. Spend when you are rich, but spend also when you're poor. Enjoin in the good, forbid in the evil. You know, aid the prophet some when he comes and give him protection. Help those who are in difficulty listen and obey in difficulty and ease. So he is giving them uh, a little bit of a connection to an, a leader, which they definitely need because they're in, they're in seeking arbitration, but he is also providing them uh, an ethic to live by to where if he's not there, they are at least abiding by an ethic to where they don't start to fight again. So he is not just approaching them and say, hey, Islam is the best, become, may, be, become uh, this or do this, do all these things. Um, and in order to become a Muslim, but he's like, hey, learn how to live together. Uh, and, and then we can start with the, with the specifics. Sometimes when we teach people about Islam, we're like, hey, you have to learn this, you have to memorize this, you have to do this, you have to do this. The Prophet was telling these people before they even came to Islam, just get along, you know, be, be, be people who get along, don't, don't be bad people. Uh, and then we'll start the more in-depth teachings. But he sends someone to go teach them, Musab uh, ibn Umair, to teach them uh, Islam. So he, he follows this up. He doesn't just give them a broad ethic, but he sends them a teacher. And just think about, it. again, this is just, 13, 11, 12, or sorry, 12 years after the message has come, think about how much Islam has developed. There's not much still there. There's not a complete Quran. There's not a complete, they have the five daily prayers, but it's not a complete faith. And so think about what is being taught in these circles. And you think about the gatherings that I mentioned of the Prophet ﷺ. What are these gatherings like when they are being replicated by his companions to other people? And they're teaching Islam. They're not worrying too much about, hey, do you know usul al-fiqh? Do you know, uh, you know, ahkam? Do you know all these different things about Islam? No, hey, let's, let's figure out how to be good people first. And then we can jump into Islam. And so uh, we see that these, these pledges occur on the final pledge that happens. You have 73 men two women that come and take a pledge from the Prophet Sallam that, that say, we, we, will, uh, we want you to come and, and stay with us. And after this major pledge, which was the second pledge of Aqaba, after the second pledge of Aqaba, the Prophet Sallam says, all right, you know what, we, we've, got, we've got a community there, it's time to go. So as we close out on this, um, I want people just to think about, because we'll talk about this next time, inshallah, um, but what was the social, economic, political risk behind migration. We're talking about Hijrah. The Prophet says, hey, all right, we've got a community 200 miles away from us here. We're going to migrate there and we're going to change our homes. Think about what that meant in the society in light of what I've kind of been talking about, how important tribal ties were, what people, what the Meccans did when uh, a group of them had left to Abyssinia, what measure they had taken, and just think about the ramifications here. I'm going to lift up a quote of the Prophet that shows you the emotional difficulty an attachment that the Prophet had with this land and with leaving it. The Prophet had related that after he had, uh, you know, settled all his debts, he had gone on, uh, gone out to the outskirts of Mecca, and he looked back at the city one last time. So just imagine just leaving your home, looking back on it one last time, and he stood on a hill saying that of all of God's earth, you, Mecca, are the dearest place to me and the dearest unto God. And had not my people driven me out from you, I would not have left you. I you didn't want to go. The Hijra was, uh, Omid Safi talks about that the Hijra was not an abandonment of Mecca. They weren't giving up. They weren't just saying, all right, you know, forget it. We're just going to go somewhere else. Nor was it forgetting of where one had come from. It was the determination to rise up from oppression with the intention of returning to redeem even that the person who oppressed. So the Prophet some didn't just say, hey, you did me bad. I'm going to come back and do you bad. You just watch what happens. Or I'm going to drive you out because you drove me out. Prophet Sallam came back, and we'll talk about this when we get to the end of the Sirah, how he came back into that city and gave those people an amnesty, gave the people who drove him out amnesty, but came back to his hometown without wanting to cause any bloodshed or anything like that. So just imagine it's not an easy journey to have to take to go 
already, you know, going from Mecca to Medina is, 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 is a bit of a bumpy ride uh, that you go through. It's not very scenic at all, but now go through 200 miles of a one to two week journey through arid desert, rocky terrain with your supplies, with your kids, with all these things. It's not a pleasant journey, but we're going to talk about that uh, next time, inshallah. So uh, next time we'll talk about the Hijrah. We'll talk about uh, the process of them also become getting remarried. Um, these will be uh, two things that we'll talk about, but uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll hold that to next time here. So anybody have any uh, 